Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Father, we stand in your presence once again by means of, and only by means of, our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. We're just thankful, so very grateful for the opportunity and the time that you've given us to, to look upon your word, to feast upon it. I just ask that the Holy Spirit be our teacher, that he would strip away all foolishness and just guide us into truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. In this series of videos, uh, we're studying together in the epistle to the Romans, verse by verse. And in our last study together, we had reached verse 24 of chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, verse 24. The Holy Spirit has given us a marvelous revelation of the holiness of God and the total depravity of man. If you've studied with us along in this series, you have you know that I've pointed out the fact that this doctrine of total depravity is an absolute truth that is virtually ignored today in the so-called Christian church. The natural man cannot receive the things of the kingdom of God. And it is astounding to me how many people quote Romans 3.23 and never realize that it is simply a phrase in the middle of a sentence. What they're saying is just part of a sentence. The righteousness of God is revealed separate from the law, even the righteousness of God, which is by the faithfulness of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. All. For all of them have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace. This is the part you don't you very rarely often hear. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. And we looked at a wonderful break in the context at verse 23 of chapter 3. Man totally depraved is now suddenly redeemed, justified freely, without a cause, by the grace of God through Christ. We then saw that God gives us the perfect illustration of that in the life of Abraham. We've talked about this in the past several videos. I think uh, the past several, couple, two or three, I pointed out to you that the most common name in the New Testament is a human name, is Abraham. Of all the names that God might have used in the New Testament, Abraham is more than any other. And that is astounding when you think about it. And the Holy Spirit uses Abraham as a great illustration of how hard we ought to work to earn God's faith. No, the faithfulness of God. It was God who called Abraham, and he is the father of all who believe. And I directed your attention to what God said in, in that those whom he foreknew, he also did, there here's this awful word, predestinate. And those whom he predestinated, he also called, there's another word that people don't like, and those whom he called, he justified. And there's a word that many Christians don't even know what it means. And that is illustrated in Abraham. God foreknew him. God predestinated him. God called him. And God made him righteous. And modern Christianity, what I've often referred to as the merit, human merit-based system, says, no, 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 that's, that's not true. Abraham made Abraham righteous by believing God, which is not what the text is teaching us. Not at all. 
Abraham's belief in God was the testimony to the fact that he was made righteous. The, mat, the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them. They that are in the flesh cannot be subject to the law of God. They cannot please God. This is what we're seeing as we go along in these studies in Romans. The natural man cannot hear the word of God. The natural man cannot come unto God. No man seeks after God. And the natural man cannot believe God. Why do you not believe my words, said Christ? Because you're not my sheep. The fundamental requirement for believing God's word is to be one of his sheep. And the great illustration of Abraham climaxes at the end of the fourth chapter that it was in the word of God. We covered that, I believe, in the last video. The emphasis was on belief. This was Abraham's response. I repeat this again because it is so crucially important to our understanding of the book. Verse 17 of this chapter, as it is written, he believed God. Abraham believed God. Verse 18, who against hope believed in hope. According to that which was spoken, again, the word of God, he staggered not at the promise. In verse 20, the word of God being fully persuaded what God had promised. Once again, the word of God. Therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. With all of that emphasis on the word of God, it's astounding to me how little time and study is spent in this book. I, I said this before, and I, I'm going to repeat it again. Folks, you should not go away from these studies saying what I believe or what I believe matters. What is supremely important is what this book says, is what God says. There, there isn't a single thing in your life, not a thing, that's as important as being, being able to just hold in your hand this book. And I'm, I'm certain that if an inventory were taken, the Word of God ranks very low in our list of priorities. I don't mind pointing that out. We see too many other things that are more important. And this book, folks, is precious. I pointed out in our last study how that the emphasis was then on, on Abraham's response after God made him righteous, after, not before, after, that Abraham believed God. We've seen in these studies that what we have been shown is that this is the righteousness of God. It belongs to him. Yet it is imputed unto us a righteousness that is based upon the faithfulness of God. And I've also mentioned that we cannot separate God's faithfulness in our lives from our faith in God because by believing God, we're believing that he's faithful. Positionally, we stand before God as righteous as his son. When the father looks down on us, he sees us as righteous as his son. And so our practical responsibility is to now believe God that what he has said is true and that he will do, which works itself out in our lives in the experiential realm, the experiential sense, the practical sense. The righteousness that is based upon faith, 
not works. The same principle that was true concerning our justification, our being made righteous, is seen to be the same principle that applies as it concerns our sanctification, our con continuance, our spiritual growth, our walk, our growing in grace and knowledge of what? Our own experience, our own efforts, our own, no, Christ. Just as in the case of Abraham, the grammar clearly points out that it was God who did it. God did it. Abraham did not participate in the action. He did not initiate the action. God did it. It was imputed unto Abraham, unto him, toward righteousness or to righteousness. God made Abraham righteous, not because of anything Abraham did, but because God chose Abraham. God chose him. Oh, that's wrong, you say. No, it's not, because Abraham was God's child. You see the same thing in the Gospels. When Christ comes to the pool of Bethesda, uh, that great crowd there that was waiting to get into the troubled waters, and Jesus said to one man, rise, take up your bed, and walk. One man he singled out. Nowadays, they'd say that's discrimination. And that was because he was God's child. The entire thread of God's word is his sovereign choice. And modern Christianity has a tremendously negative reaction. It's almost like you stuck them with a cattle prod to the clear statement of scripture that God chooses man. I mean, we're talking about God here. And I've pointed out that it does so because it refuses to accept the truth of man's total depravity. Total depravity demands, insists upon the existence of divine election. For the most part, man believes he's not spiritually dead and therefore has, he has the ability to choose God. Whereas the scriptures declare no man seeks after God, that man is spiritually dead and has no ability to seek after God, much less choose God. There's not a word about any of the unfaithfulness in Abraham's life. Not, not a single word. God saw Abraham as righteous because he made him righteous. And God sees us as righteous because, and only because, he made us righteous. Therefore, we have peace with God. What kind of good news do you want that God has nothing against you? We're reading in our text, this was not written for his sake alone. It was written for us. We were in the mind of God before time began. No, it wasn't written for everybody. One of the things that seems to make people the, the maddest is how dogmatic and how elective God is. There are sheep and there are goats. There are wheat and there are tare. And there's they and us. It was written for us. It wasn't written for them. It was written for us. If we jump ahead to the first verse of chapter 5 for just a moment. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. The opposite of that is, is that those who aren't justified are at war with God. The they are at war with God. The us are at peace with God. It was written for us. Now, if you have the authorized version, to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, 
And once again, the conclusion is that all of this depends on us. And that, of course, is most of modern Christianity. It depends on what you do. But that is not biblical. Even if we accept this translation, we have to, and I love the King James Version, we have to compare Scripture with Scripture. You are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. Well, if, if you are my sheep, you'll believe. If you don't believe, it's because you're not my sheep. That's Romans or John chapter 10. So we don't become a sheep based upon whether or not we believe. We believe based upon the fact that we are a sheep. His sheep will believe. It's amazing how many people have wrestled with that passage of, of, of Scripture. Reconciled if we continue in the faith. I've heard this my whole life. I mean, the translators must have really scratched their heads on that. How can we stress a present reality based upon a future contingency? Look at the text. Now, are you reconciled? If you continue in the faith and you will. It's a first class condition. What if you don't continue in the faith? Well, you must not be now reconciled. And yet the great emphasis is that it depends on you. You've got to continue in the faith. In, in the faith. You have to continue in the faith. If you don't continue in the faith, you're not reconciled. The idea is it's put on man to continue in the faith, otherwise he won't be reconciled. When the text says you will, because you will continue in the faith because you're reconciled. What God has done for you is absolutely certain. The results aren't tenuous. They're absolutely fixed. Therefore, it is by the faithfulness of Christ in order that the promise might be absolutely certain to all the seed. All the seed. And then you say to the average Christian that every single one of God's children will be in heaven and they get mad at you. I, I can't imagine why anybody would get mad at that. I, I think it's wonderful to know that all of God's children, all of God's children are going to be with him. I think that's wonderful. It was written for us. Now that Bible verse says, I'll translate it the best I can, but it's written for us also to whom it is destined to be imputed. That's what the word there in the original text, destined. Those of us who believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. There is no conditional clause in verse 24. The four conditional clauses in the Greek, first, second, third, and fourth. None of those there. None of those are there. There is not a conditional clause in verse 24. Those whom it is destined to be imputed, those believing, that's a present participle. Those believing on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead. Think about the grammar for a moment. Because it's, it's going to be important. We're going to look at, at, at two participles. Here's a present participle in verse 1 of chapter 5. It's an aorist, passive participle. The present participle is concurrent with the main verb. So, the believing and the imputing are simultaneous. 
when God makes one righteous, he's a believer. If, if one were not a believer, could he believe? The answer has to be no. Folks, if a man's not a murderer, would he commit murder? No. I mean, what comes first? He has to be a murderer before he murders. Just like a person has to be a thief before he steals. If you say this man is absolutely not a thief, he will never steal. He can't steal unless he's a thief. He can't murder unless he's a murderer. He can't flee unless he's a hireling. And he can't believe unless he's a believer. And yet, modern thought seems to be that you become a believer by believing. You've got to be kidding. You don't do that in any other concept. You believe because you're a believer. Us, those of us believing on him who raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. You didn't make yourself a believer. God did. The same is, is true of my physical body. I am not breathing so that I'll be alive. I'm breathing because I'm alive. My heart is not beating so that I'll be alive. It beats because I am alive. What I'm trying to explain to you is that you, you're part of the us and you're part of the us before the beginning of time. We were chosen in Christ before the disruption or the foundation of the world. Who, verse 24, who, and I'm, I'm reading from the original text, But also on account of us, it is intended to be credited to those believing on the one, that is God, having raised Jesus, the Lord of us, out from, the words ek there in the Greek, out from the dead. It's nothing whatsoever conditional seen in the original text. Even when we compare translations, and I know that most of you, it's easy for you to do that. We see that many of them, these other translations, are in agreement with the fact that there is no condition to be found there, which is entirely consistent with the rest of Scripture, the analogy of Scripture. Verse 25, Jesus our Lord was delivered. It's an aorist passive. He was delivered for our offenses. For our offense. The Greek word is dia because of our offenses. You have to stop and think about that for a moment. Christ did not come and willingly die in our place to put sand in Satan's mouth. He came and he died because of Dia, our offenses. Now, the, the I've got to tell you, the uh, I was thinking of this the other day. Uh, I know it says four in the authorized version. If I was to say to you, uh, I'm going home now, 
uh, because my work here is done, you wouldn't think that strange. But if I said, I'm, I'm going home now for my work is done, well, you'd think that's a little odd. You'd, you'd say, well, Steve, people don't really talk like that anymore. And that's exactly why you see four in the, in the text. It makes much more sense for me to say, and, and I'm not just making this up. I mean, if you look at the word dia in the original text, which is where you see the word for, the word is dia, you'll see that it means on account of, because of. But the King James, the translators, I guess, and I, I, I'm, I'm assuming that it's because of, of, it is the King James. This is how they, they talked. They would have said, uh, I'm going home now, for I am through working. Are you following what I'm saying here? Through Adam. Through Adam. I mean, this is for a fact we know. Through Adam. Sin entered the world system, and death through sin... So death passed upon all men. That was, that was God's judgment. It's astounding to me how many sermons I hear that God commands you to do something. Therefore, because he commands you to do something, therefore you're able to do it. Look at the Ten Commandments. Are you suggesting to me that Israel was able to keep all of the commandments that God gave them to love the Lord their God with all their heart and their mind and all their strength and their neighbor as themselves. Not only could they not love God that way, there's no way that they can love their neighbor that way. No way. No way could they have kept the law. This is, here's my point. Does God, folks, does God have the right to demand something that you can't do? Well, you know, you take that up with him. I think he absolutely has the right to do that. Why is a person responsible? because someone holds them responsible. That's all. Ability doesn't have one thing to do with responsibility, not a bit. The only reason that you have or I have any responsibility at all is because some somebody, someone holds us responsible. If, if, if there was not a lawgiver holding you responsible, well, uh, you can get in your vehicle and you can drive any, any speed limit you want. You are only responsible to God because he holds you responsible. He was delivered for our offenses or because of our offenses. There wasn't one of us that wasn't guilty. There wasn't one of us who could say that they sin not. And it was our offenses that caused him to be delivered. And he was raised again. And again, it's, it's Dia because of, because of our being made righteous. It seems to me that we are treading on very holy ground. This uh, past, this last Easter, I'm sure there were like some 10,000 sermons preached on Christ revealing his manhood when he shrunk from the cross, that he prayed that he prayed that if it'd be possible, he'd get out of dying on that cross. Never prayed such a thing. 
If Christ prayed that which he knew not to be the Father's will, then he sinned. You can say, nevertheless, thy will be done because you don't know the Father's will. But for you to tell me that Christ did not know that it was the Father's will that he come and die in our place would be a charade. Of course he did. And to ask to get out of it would be sin. And if he sinned, then he's not my Savior. But the Word says, the Word says that during the days of Jesus' earthly life, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard. He was heard. In that, he was delivered. Delivered from what? Delivered from what? He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, verse 25. Now, verse 25, look at your text. Verse 25, who was delivered for or because of our offenses and was raised again because of our justification. It's, it's crucially important that Jesus Christ, folks, became my kinsman. It is crucially important that he paid the price that I could not pay. And it is crucially important that he rose from the dead. He was delivered because of or on account of my sin. The price that he paid made me righteous. Get that? The price he paid made me righteous, and because that price was sufficient, he rose from the dead. If he hadn't risen from the dead, well, that's tantamount to saying the price paid was inefficient. And it was because of or on account of our justification, he was raised from the dead. Because God made us righteous, God raised Jesus from the dead. Through the obedience of the one, Christ, the many were made righteous. That is justified. That's what the word justified means. When were we made righteous? When he died. Therefore, he was raised from the dead because of our justification. Sin and righteousness, you know, we're looking at the two opposite extremes. There, there are two words that every single Christian I, I know of <clears throat> are aware of. Yet it burdens me as to why Christians are not leaving church on Sunday morning, not leaving a Sunday morning church service, having heard two things. The sin issue has forever been settled through the death of Christ and God raised Jesus from the dead because through his obedience to the cross we were made righteous that in fact God calls us saints so sin issue settled God calls us saints he's declared us saints he's made us righteous how often do you hear that Modern Christianity has strayed far off course from the truth of this book. It's lost its moral compass. It's adrift on the Sea of Galatia. Now, by that I mean it's fully embraced the Galatian error, which is justification by works of the law. If it does speak about grace... 
it'll, it'll turn right around and contradict itself. It'll turn right around and it'll place the believer back under law as a principle of life, a rule of life. It, it attempts to reconcile the two, to merge the two. Grace and law. Mix the two. Just put them in a blender and mix them up. It'll be just fine. As if there's some place for both within the Christian's life, when this book says that we have died to the law in order that we might bear fruit unto God. You know, as many of you know, I was a, I was a Navy uh, bosun mate back in the 70s. I, I stood helm watches, I, but I was so awful at it. You know, I got yelled at a lot on the bridge for getting really far off course. Helmsman, mind your helm. You know, I, I can still hear that ringing in my ears today. That's how I see modern Christianity. Off course. Way off course. And it it's compasses the word. A walk by sight takes us off the path where we would walk with our Lord. He's there with us. Make no mistake about it. But there's little real fellowship. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. But I'm talking about fellowship. Imagine And imagine two men walking alongside one another, folks, all right? Where their conversation is centered around Christ and what, not themselves, their failures, what are on Christ and what he has done, is doing, and will do, where the focus is all on him, where he is being glorified every moment, every step that they take. Nothing about self, that is what's what we ought to do or what, what we should have done or, or you know, why did we do this or how can we do this? How, how we could be better if only we would try harder, just do the right thing where, where God, if we do, then God's pleased with us and where the heart is locked into an embrace with self. The focus is all on self rather than him, our Savior. There's the simple contrast. The reprogramming ourselves to the truths of grace is not something that we even do. That's his job. He'll, he'll do that when the focus is on him and not ourselves. The right program will come to appear as normal as breathing. The difficulty comes in as, as we continue in the faith, oftentimes alone in a desert that he leads us through, where that there's no one but us and him. No family, no friends, but all a necessary part of the spiritual growth process so that our attention can settle on him. Folks, the way up has always been down. The, the minority is opposed to the majority. The least popular is opposed to the popular. True Christianity goes against logic, all human logic and reason. The whole thing does. This whole book does. What seems right to a man, Christianity turns it upside down or 180 degrees around. Law seems right, seems proper, but grace turns that around. Our works appears to be the focus, yet the branch is to abide in the vine. And whether we're talking about justification or sanctification, new birth or growth, God's love and grace is the motivating factor. Law will never do that. Law will never provide a peace that surpasses understanding or a joy unspeakable. Alienation from the religious system is a product or a result of true spiritual growth. You know you're going in the right direction. The human merit-based religious system will never change. God calls upon us to come out and be separate from it. Doesn't mean you have to abandon all your friends. It's the system that I'm talking about. Christ Jesus stated in Luke chapter 12, many of you are familiar 
Do you suppose that I came to give peace upon earth? I'll tell you not at all, but rather division. Oh, Steve, let's don't be so divisive. For from now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two and two against three. Father will be divided against son, son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law. And daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. It seems though our Lord didn't leave anyone out. I believe this from the bottom of my heart. If we, you and I, if we had stood beside Jesus when he confronted the chief priests and the Pharisees and the religious Jews, over this very issue. Well, let me just ask you, would we have also condemned him? Or would we have followed him into the desert or the mountains of Judea? Where else could we go? He was, he is the word of life. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you again for just the little time that we've had just to think about your word. I just ask that you would seal to our hearts that which is truth and only truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. This is Steve. I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for watching.